I actually am here to remind us this morning of a very simple uh, but important command and uh, directive that Jesus gave us just before he left earth. Um, and the, the point of my sermon this morning is not necessarily to just recap every other Great Commission sermon you've heard, but it is going to be the foundation by which we kick this off. So this message and command is simple, and we often find it difficult to fulfill. Uh, Hopefully we'll discover this morning some practical and applicable ways that we can take the command of the Great Commission and take uh, some other things that uh, some of our uh, apostles say later on in the scriptures and apply it to our lives to better enable us to evangelize to those around us. But let's go ahead and kick off with uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this command, like I said, is probably one of the least followed directives given by Jesus. See, as Christians in today's society, we seem to have more difficulty following this command than any other command given by Jesus. And while there are many reasons that we have difficulty uh, carrying out this this directive, a lot of those problems stem from simply misunderstanding uh, the spirit of of this command, I think. See, this isn't just a command to to preach and teach. We we tend to think, well, I'm going to have difficulty getting up on a soapbox or getting behind a pulpit or, or, or speaking something that I'm not too confident about. But really, Jesus was asking us to pursue people. This was a command to go and disciple people, go and, and build relationships with people. See, Jesus pursued people, and we have a recorded account of that for at least three years of his ministry, where all he did was pursue people, and he did it in three ways. He either was preaching and teaching, you know, he's teaching people about the scriptures and, and about his father, or he was dining with people, eating food and sharing a meal, or He was um, just spending time um, and doing life every day with with his disciples or with the multitudes and the crowds. So preaching and teaching, doing life, and eating food. Three things things I love to do. So um, the Great Commission was a command that we seem to have trouble executing. We can go to church every Sunday morning, Wednesday night. We can join a small group. We can serve at um, at one of our ministries or serve at a soup kitchen or... We can do a vast majority of good things, but very few of us um, really feel like we have the boldness, the confidence, the ability to just simply get up and and preach or teach somebody about the good news. We can do all these wonderful things, but we can't seem to evangelize. So today, I want to address and just simply focus on three reasons why I think we sometimes fail to be able to do this. Three things. One, we don't know what to say. We, we just simply don't know what words to use or, or how to start the conversation. Or we're afraid that we're not going to have the, the right answers to the questions that we might get bombarded with. And then third, we're afraid that the evangelizing might change the relationship with whoever we're talking to. So let's start by uh, admitting something. I'm going to start uh, by admitting to you guys, and I hope all of you will Uh, join me in this. These three reasons that I just listed have held me back for years in uh, evangelizing when I've been presented opportunities to to talk with someone. Uh, Over the years in studying and talking with others, I've learned that I'm not the only one to struggle with this. Um, I'm sure many of you have had the same insecurities or the same um, hurdles to overcome. And so today I just want to present a couple things that I think will help us um, get over these hurdles and apply some practical ways that we can pursue people better so that God may be glorified. So let's tackle the what to say first. Uh, I want to begin by saying that the way you live is often better than, uh, is often a better starting point rather than what you have to say. Let your behavior earn you the right to speak to others about God. Matthew five fifteen through 16. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. 
behavior demonstrates your values greater than what you tell people your values are. No one cares about what you're saying if you're not backing it up by the way that you're living. How we live and behave, and specifically how we treat others, can often and does show them how different we are and how strange we are. See, people are intrigued by the things that are different. They take notice of the things that are strange and weird. How often have you heard friends or family members ask you why you seem different from some of the others that they encounter? How often have you heard people ask you, what's so different about you? Why do you seem so full of joy? Why are you so nice? Why, are, why, do, why don't you use the type of language that my friends do? Why don't you do anything that seems questionable? Why do you seem to have integrity and, uh, and just all-around goodness? When people start asking these questions, when people start prodding why we seem different, that's our golden opportunity to share the why behind your behavior. You have earned the right to be heard. You've opened that door. They have invited you to talk about Jesus, and most of the time, we simply struggle, like I said, to figure out how to start the conversation. We struggle to, to figure out, how do I say this without sounding like a fruitcake? We question whether it will be awkward or whether we'll lose their interest in the first 10 seconds. But when, we, but when they ask, we know that they are genuinely interested. And we didn't have to do anything or say anything other than live a Christ-focused life in front of others. And see, this is what Christians get the biggest grief in our society for. We say that we have all these values, principles, and beliefs, but then hypocritically we behave in a way that demonstrates the opposite. So don't fall into the same stereotype. Don't be like other Christians that society has come to know and loathe. Be the example, and people may ask you why you're different. People in our world think that we stand on street corners and shout, the end is near, and you're going to hell. And there are some people that do that. And this image of Christianity has been popularized by Hollywood and TV. And unfortunately, we as the universal church have done more to fuel this fire than paint a different picture. Mostly, this comes down to a simple image. Christians are seen as judgmental and unloving. And if that is how we are seen, we aren't living up to Christ's expectation for us as evangelists. John thirteen thirty five. your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So I said it a minute ago, but I'm going to, it's all about how we treat people. See, it's all about how we love one another. And it goes a long way to evangelizing without even having to stand on a soapbox or get behind a pulpit. Loving others well, for example, not condemning those in your office uh, for going out for happy hour or not being religious or for swearing in front of you, not coming down on them for those things, but loving them in spite of their faults and mistakes and being a loving encouragement to them demonstrates to others that you may be a little different. You may be a little strange. So love your neighbor. Love your coworker because uh, even though they may cause you stress, you're called to love them and it'll demonstrate to them that you are different. Love your family member that constantly ridicules you for going to church. Love the person on the road that cuts you off. Love the lady in the checkout line with a bajillion coupons. These are all opportunities for us to simply be different, live different, and demonstrate to others that we care in a way that others may not have ever shown them. We love by being patient and by being kind toward one another. We love by bearing one another's faults. We love by encouraging and praying for one another. It's not easy to put up with somebody else's faults. It's not easy to be patient with somebody. It's rarely easy to bear someone else, and it's even kind of hard to be kind to them. It's really hard to encourage someone and pray for them when they're driving you up a wall. But one evangelistic phrase that I, I've, I've always loved, um, it's a great opportunity, this is, uh, don't take it too seriously. Jesus loves you, and I'm trying. It's true. When someone is making you really angry, you can just look at them and say, Jesus loves you. And then you can tell them how much of a Christ follower you are and say, and I'm trying really hard. While that may be laughable, 
it is how we need to treat people. We need to remember that as much as somebody drives us up a wall or does things that are counter to, to the way we want to live, Jesus loves them, and we need to love them too. And by loving them, we'll be able to evangelize them in a greater way than just preaching down their throat. So live like Christ and love others, and you may have someone ask you why you seem so different. And then if they do ask, we're going to look to 1 Peter 3.15. And if someone asks you about the hope, your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Peter tells us that the best way to share our faith with others is simply to share your testimony or share the reasons that you have faith in Jesus Christ. What to say doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be some rehearsed message that you only half understand. It doesn't have to be some, com- uh, some complicated exegetical explanation. You could try to tell everyone you encounter why they should believe. You could give them a world of evidence to prove that God exists and that creation happened at his word and that Jesus took on physical flesh and resurrected from the dead. And I do believe that apologetics have value. But I don't believe that they have greater value than simple personal testimony. Me telling somebody why I believe what I believe is sometimes a greater impact than me telling them all the things that prove why I'm saying what I'm saying. See, I've met people who would tell you that the reason they encountered Christ and choose to follow him is because their Christian friend shared with them how much Christ changed them. Personal testimony and personal reasons and personal faith. When we get personal with something, people listen. If we show people why we're different, even strange, they may be curious enough to ask us why. And if they ask us, we have an opportunity to speak and share our personal reasons for why we follow Jesus. Therefore, by letting our actions show who we are, we don't have to worry about not knowing what to say. Because the right questions and the right opportunities will present themselves as people begin to notice our peculiar behavior. So I encourage you to be prepared for that time by knowing what your personal testimony is. Take some time this week to say, what, what reasons do I have? What, how did my, my life with Christ start? Take that time to write it down, to flesh it out, to know the story for yourself. Be prepared. Understand that being able to explain why you believe in God is not something you want to be flustered by. So our first point is obviously that what to say is simply live in a way that seems different and be prepared to give your personal testimony. Share with somebody the reasons that you love God and why Christ has changed you. Our second hurdle to evangelism is that we're afraid we won't have the right answers or any answers to theological questions. I want you to remember simply that you don't have to have a theology degree in order to share the good news that has changed your life. You don't have to go to Bible college. You don't even have to take a test. You just have to be able to share what it is about you that God has changed. When we first become Christians, we are often excited to share the wonderful news of the truth and the grace that we've encountered, right? We all seem full of zeal and on fire, Or for some of us, we spend a weekend at a revival and we get rejuvenated by the right sermon. And we're ready to go and conquer the world and and convert everybody. Until someone asks us a question about the Bible or about religion that we don't quite understand. And then the spotlight is on us. And this is where we, we tense up. Our mouth goes dry like mine is right now. We start to sweat. We lose our nerve. And we don't know what to say. I mean, what if, they, what if someone asks a really big and hard question like, uh, what does heaven look like? Or what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did, did Adam have a belly button? And what did Noah do with all that poo? Of course, at this point, in our hypothetical conversations, we come to the realization that we can't share the gospel with other people because we just simply don't know what Noah did with all that poo. All these conversations we make up in our head, and really, we just need to, to stop complicating it. So let's put this common misconception, common misconception to rest. You don't have to have a theology major 
in order to share the gospel. It is important to get the facts right. I'm not saying it's not. It's important to know uh, the, the facts and know what you're talking about. But it's, it shouldn't be the thing that stops us. It shouldn't be the thing that hinders us from sharing the good news. And it's okay to tell somebody who asks a question that you don't know the answer to, I don't know. I don't know. But let's find out. Let's find out together. It's going to be so much better that if you don't know a question, that you don't say, I don't know, you're going to have to figure that out on your own, and let's skip over it. Rather, it would be better if you said, I have no idea, because I've never encountered that before. But let's go find out together. Let's go open the word together. Let's go talk to somebody together. If you don't know how to to find the answer to the question that's being asked, if you look in Scripture and you can't discover what, what the truth of the answer is, then I encourage you to reach out to someone here at Severn Christian Church. Reach out to one of our leadership, one of our one of our elders, one of our teachers, one of our evangelists. Ask for help. Don't just simply skim over the question. Go to the Bible first or ask for help. Of course, someone may not even ask you a direct or complicated question. They might simply ask you why you go to church. Why why do you do that? What do you get out of it? They might ask you why you believe in God. What is it that gives you such faith that he really exists? They might ask you why you read a book written thousands of years ago by so many different people. They might ask you those simple questions. And you can just simply say, because these are the reasons that the Bible has changed me. This is the reason that, that Christ has impacted. These are the reasons Christ has impacted my life. These are the things that have happened that give me hope. This is an opportunity for that door to be opened and us to say, this is my testimony. This is what I believe. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be some huge explanation. It can be very simple. So in addition to sharing your personal testimony, I encourage you to tell others about the awesomeness of God. In Luke, Jesus references how excited we should be about sharing our faith with others. Luke 15, 8 through 9. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and her neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. See, this is an opportunity for us to just simply share our joy. Have you ever looked for something? For most of you, it's probably your keys or your cell phone or or something else. And have you just kind of been like just overwhelmed when you finally discover it? I lose my keys all the time, and there's there's two reasons for this. One, I leave them in stupid places, and I just pray, God, please help me find my keys. Last Sunday this happened. I came out of a restaurant. I literally left my car running the entire time we were in the restaurant. I was like, Tabby, do you know do you have my keys? you know where my keys are? I can't find my keys. And I walk up to the car. I'm like, that's weird. It's kind of humming. Tabby, did you already start the car? She's like, are you kidding me? You left the car running the entire time. We were in that restaurant. I was like, well, it's a good thing we were right there. (laughs) I was really overjoyed that my car was still there. So (laughs) that was the joy I felt. I wanted to party. So when we're full of joy, when we find something that we've lost or when when something happens that brings us so much joy, we want to share it. We want to tell others about it. And this is the way that we should communicate to others how much God has done for us. Do you get excited about what God has done in your life? Do you really? Or do you just kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get excited about it. He's awesome, right? It's great. But does it actually motivate you to do anything? Does it motivate you to say anything? Because I know for me, I love God. I really do. I mean, I, my faith is, I've never, I've never had like a crisis of faith or, or a moment where I'm like, I just don't know if I really believe that. But I have had moments, mul- numerous times in my life, long periods of time in my life, where I've just said, I'm really passionate about God. I'm really passionate about serving. But I'm not motivated to go out and say anything. I'm not motivated to talk to somebody or tell them why I, I believe what I believe. I'm not motivated to to really strike up a conversation with a stranger or even a family member and say those things. Have you ever experienced that? You believe it. You love him. But does it change the way way you are motivated to, to talk to people? If we're full of joy, we need to be ready to, to take it, embrace it, and move with it. 
When you have really good news, you can't contain the information, right? When you see on your news feed that Wawa has free coffee, how many of you share that and text everybody? Am I the only one? I know you people drink coffee. I know Lori does. Do you drink Wawa coffee, Lori? Okay. Or when you discover some new commodity in Walmart or on Amazon that you're like, oh my goodness, this is revolutionary to my household living. I'm going to share it. I'm going to tell everybody about it. I'm going to buy one for everybody this Christmas. How many of you do that? I'm sure. I'm sure. Don't, don't have to raise your hand. It's fine. Or when you experience awesome service at Chick-fil-A or bad service at Chick-fil-A, you feel compelled to tell everybody, don't you? You're like, man, this is really good service. Or shockingly, this is really bad service at Chick-fil-A. Like this is something that I need to tell everybody about. I'm full of joy because I just received awesome service or I just discovered this life-changing thing and I need to make sure everybody I know knows it too. But how often do we read our Bible and we discover some joyful truth and say, I need to tell people about this? I want us to take, um, I guess, take our cue from David. See, David was a great example of being sold out and in love with God. David is credited with being the majority writer of the book of Psalms. He wrote 73 Psalms, and if we read it, we can, we can see that David regularly praised God. He wrote his praises of God because he loved the God that he served. And Psalms 103 is a great example of how to tell others about how great and awesome God is. So Psalms 103, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. That dry mouth I was talking about. All right. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. He forgives all my sins and he heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like like the eagle's. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. If you have nothing else to say in your own personal testimony, use David's. Those those six verses are a great list of examples of just how awesome God is. Someone who forgives my sins and heals my diseases, redeems me from death, and crowns me with love, and blesses me with good things. This is the God that I would want to love and follow. Learn from David's example. Tell other people why God is so awesome. Tell them about the God who created the universe. Tell them about how he delivered a nation through oppression repeatedly throughout history because he loved them. Tell them about how God sent his son apart from himself to, be, to come to earth and become human so all could be redeemed um, from its sinfulness. Explain how Jesus sacrificed himself on a cross in a brutal death just simply because he loved us. Tell them about how God has made promises to take care of us and how he has done that in your life. When we serve and follow an awesome God, do we not? Okay, good. Just make sure you're awake. We don't have to prove to people through historical evidence or a systematic argumentation of intense apologetics why they should do the same because we just have to explain to them that why we have faith and hope in Jesus Christ and the Bible. It's simple. He loved us. He loves them. It's a simple message. It's not complicated. Sometimes we overcomplicate it. So lastly, we're going to come to our third hurdle. We shy away from evangelizing because we're afraid of how it will change the relationship. We don't want to tell our friends because we think that they won't like us anymore or think that we're maybe too judgy. I want to remind you of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Luke 16, 19 through 31, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. 
There in torment, he saw Abraham in in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. And the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip his dip the finger of his the dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. And the rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Abraham seems a little cold-hearted right here, but uh, I think we just need to remember that this is a parable. Um, I don't know that this really occurred in the historical context. But let's examine how this applies to our evangelism with our family and friends. Many of us have lost loved ones at some time in our lives, and... If we did some honest examination of what we know to be biblical truth and what we know of some of our loved ones, we might be able to guess, at least on the surface, where their, what their eternal destination is. And I hope that for many of us, our loved ones were and are born-again Christians. But I expect that that may not be the case for some of us, or even most of us. So let's assume that just about everyone in here at least knows someone from their past who is not going to be in heaven. What do you think they would want to communicate to their loved ones that they've left behind? Based on what Luke tells us and the description we see throughout the Old and the New Testament, I don't think that their message is going to be, come join the party. They'd probably want to communicate, don't end up here. See, we don't want to evangelize to our family because we believe that they're going to think that we're just hokey and we're condemning them or a family member who's passed. How many have heard that? If I accept Christ, I'll be saying that grandma isn't in heaven. And how many of you have been hindered by that? I'm seeing nodding. I know some of you have had that same conversation. I was at my great-grandfather's funeral a couple of Aprils ago, and that was exactly the conversation that was happening at his funeral. My grandmother got up and said, I know my father's in heaven. And unfortunately, I'm not so sure that's true. But that very conversation is exactly why I've been hindered from having that conversation with my grandmother. But we can't let the fear of condemning somebody keep us from helping some of the, those that we still have here from learning the truth. I would rather have my grandmother be upset with me for a time than never see her in eternity. See, our time is limited. Matthew twenty five thirteen says, So you too must keep watch, for you don't know the day or the hour of my returning. And John 9, 4 says, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. We don't know how much time we have left. So let's not let fear debilitate us. See, I would rather my friends dislike me, my family turn away from me, for me expressing to them how much I know about the truth, than wonder for eternity if my words could have changed their eternal destination. Which, by the way, if you do it right, it doesn't ha- you don't have to send somebody to hell in order to teach them the truth. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to just immediately come out and go, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. You start by loving them. If they know you care, if they know you really love them and what's going to happen to them, if they know that you're really concerned about what's going on in their lives, then they might be willing to listen. Listen long enough to say, hey, I don't know if you've ever considered this, but the Bible has a lot to say about the way we need to live. 
and I'm a little concerned about the way you're choosing to live. And let me just talk to you about God. Thank <laughs> you.